precise and lethal. The military equivalent of a hole in one. But on history's front nine, there were a lot of bogeys. Direct hits, duds, and dummies. The secret mission of a lost Kennedy. And the breakthroughs that gave the bomb a brain. Now, Smart Bombs on Modern Marvels. They streak to the spot of a laser. The crosshairs of a camera. Or the pinpoint of GPS coordinates. To strike the right spot at the optimum altitude and angle. In some cases, spread the explosive energy in the right direction. And in some cases, even do that in a three-dimensional sense. It hits a place not only at the right point on the ground, but buries underneath the ground in just the right place. Typically, smart bombs have no propulsion systems of their own, but are steered in free fall by winglets. The Tomahawk cruise missile, one of the workhorses of the Iraq war, also uses GPS guidance and television imagery. But its jet engine makes it a missile, not a smart bomb. There's one other critical difference. Cruise missiles cost at least $500,000 each. A smart bomb, as little as $20,000. Smart bombs seem to burst on the scene amid enormous hype during the two wars with Iraq. But long before the bandwagon of the 1990s, there were smart bombs. In 1919, Charles Kettering, one of the fathers of precision guidance, had this to say about his brainchild. What is regarded as one of the most destructive weapons invented during the war has been placed in the secret archives of the War Department of Washington. There to remain, it is hoped, even by the inventor, for all times. Dire words to describe a flimsy biplane whose first flight ended miserably. But this was the world's first smart bomb. World War I pilots experienced for the first time the stark equation of aerial bombing. Precision equals proximity to the target. But the closer you get to the enemy, the better your chances of getting shot out of the sky. General rule is if the target is worth destroying by us, it's worth protecting by the enemy. So any target you're going after is probably going to be fairly heavily defended. The only way to stem the carnage was to start removing the pilot from the equation to make a remote-controlled bomb. This is the so-called aerial torpedo, a prototype for a guided weapon invented in 1918 for the U.S. Navy. Not to be outdone, the Army appealed to an inventor and future president of General Motors. They went to Charles F. Kettering and asked him if he could develop something similar for them. Officially still called an aerial torpedo, the bomb was nicknamed the Kettering Bug. The bug was a hybrid chemical weapon with a 200-pound payload of high explosives and mustard gas. A wing and motor assembly was fitted onto the warhead. For a runway, a short section of dolly track. After its first crashes, Kettering's bug finally flew. The fluttering you see is caused by continuous steering input from gyroscopic stabilizers. range was controlled by an odometer that counted propeller revolutions. When it reached a preset distance, up to 75 miles, the ignition was killed and the bomb dove. But there were a great many bugs in Kettering's bug, which was unreliable in testing and deployed too late for combat. Still in great secrecy, work continued on guided bombs. As two wings gave way to one, in early December 1941, a new kind of flying bomb was tested. Its first flight, as sorry as the Kettering bugs. But on December 8, 1941, one day after the Pearl Harbor attack, 
the so-called controllable bomb went airborne. An early version of an optical or television bomb. That's right. It's 1941 and the military already had a TV camera inside a bomb. From a chase plane, the bombardiers saw the TV image and flew the bomb by radio controls, like a really big remote control plane. You're essentially sitting inside the bomb because the TV camera's in the nose and you're flying the bomb. But as the conflict deepened, the U.S. military thought it had the answer to precision bombing. And it wasn't the controllable bomb. In order not to bomb churches, habitations, and only to hit military targets, an instrument of this nature was vital. The bomb site is just this instrument. The famed Norden Mark 15 bomb site aimed a bomb drop while taking over a plane's controls during the approach. Call these dumb bombs, and you'll have to answer to a lot of B-17 bombardiers. The bombs weren't so dumb. The equipment they had, the bomb sites they had, were actually pretty good. Under a calm environment, a single airplane can drop the bombs generally within 500 feet of a target. But when you put them in large formations and throw in bad weather and people shooting at them, the typical World War II bomb missed by more than a thousand feet from any target. That's why it would take hundreds and even thousands of airplanes, say, to destroy a single factory. The military term was bombs per acre, saturation bombing. The ghastly contest of attrition by saturation bombing was the way of the war. But each of the great powers also dabbled in precision-guided weapons. The terror bombers of the age flew a barbaric kind of smart bomb. Kamikazes. Obviously, it, it kills the pilot, but they provide that terminal guidance for an anti-ship missile. The Germans had a sizable arsenal of guided bombs. One was the Fritz X, named for the X or cross of its tail which could be remotely controlled during the bomb's descent. It had a flare on the back of it so that uh, the pilot could see where the bomb was, and then he would steer it with a little toggle switch, just like you fly model airplanes today. And he would guide that and just superimpose that bright dot over the target and, and glide it in. Another German smart bomb was the Henschel 293, a glide bomb able to fly great distances as the bombardier sighted its flare into the target. This American glide bomb is television guided, like the earlier controllable bomb. The bulge beneath the bomb houses the TV camera. The shallow angle of attack was another advantage to the glide bomb. It skipped the ground until it found the target. Here's the view from the bomb, looking remarkably like an image from the 1990s. But the year is 1944. The German V-2 rocket lit a fire under yet another smart bomb project, one that involved the first son of an ill-starred American family. By the fall of 1944, the V-2 was striking British cities. Secretly, an American project codenamed Aphrodite was underway to destroy the V-2 launch sites. Worn out bombers, like the B-24 depicted in this period cartoon, were re-enlisted. Wired for radio remote control. Fitted with television cameras. The plane was then loaded up with explosives to make the equivalent of a 20,000-pound bomb. 
One of the Aphrodite volunteers was Joe Kennedy Jr. Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. was a Navy pilot. He had just completed his tour of duty in, in Europe. Technically, he could have gone home, but he volunteered to stay for this highly classified project. Basically, he had volunteered to be a takeoff pilot. Pilot and co-pilot were needed to get the bomber airborne, after which they could parachute to safety. The pilotless bomber could then be remotely steered over the channel and into the V-2 sites. On August 12, 1944, Kennedy took off on mission number three. Joe Jr.'s mission should have been a really short one. He and his co-pilot, Wilfred Willey, really just needed to take this bomber off, get it in into straight and level flight, and then bail out. While they were still over Britain, there was a premature detonation. As a secret report said, the plane was, quote, suddenly enveloped in a large circular ball of flame and white smoke and disintegrated in the air. The bodies of Kennedy and his co-pilot were never found. Aphrodite flew a few more missions, but never knocked out a V-2 base. Later in 1944, the project was scrapped. Then, the drive towards guided weapons abruptly vanished in twin mushroom clouds. Hiroshima. Nagasaki. Development of conventional guided munitions ceased, and they ceased all funding for it and all interest in it because they thought that the nuclear weapons would replace all that and there would not be any more conventional wars. But the history of warfare was about to take a few unexpected detours through places like Korea and Vietnam, places where you could never drop a nuke because of the political fallout but where you could sure use a bomb precisely guided by a laser beam. The first battleship sunk by a guided weapon was the Italian ship Roma. On September 9, 1943, as she was attempting to defect to the Allies, the Roma was struck by two Fritz X bombs and blown in half. Smart bombs will return on Modern Marvels. Bombs away over North Korea. Or rather, bomb away. Because in theory, you just needed one. The bright red bridge killer, called a Tarzan. All 13,000 pounds worth. The Tarzan was so big that a B-29 could only hold one, one bomb. And even, even to hold one, it had to have a modified bomb bay where it was half exposed. What's in a name? In the case of Tarzan, it's a resume of guided weapons since World War II. The first precision weapon or radio-controlled weapon that was produced in real quantity during World War II was the Azon, which was an acronym for azimuth only. Azimuth means horizontal. An Azon could only be steered left and right. Late in the war, distance or range control was achieved. This new class of guided bombs were called Razons for range and azimuth only control. Finally, there was the Tall Boy, or British oversized bomb the bunker buster of its day. Tarzan stood for tall boy range and azimuth only bomb. The knockout punch of a tall boy combined with the pinpoint control of the Razon. The maneuver uh, capability of that weapon was on the order of about a thousand feet left or right and probably about a thousand feet long or short of where it would hit if you had put no guidance into it at all. Like the guided bombs of World War II, a flare ignited as the Tarzan fell. The bombardier used a joystick to keep the flare superimposed over the target. But there was a problem with Tarzans and other Korean-era guided bombs. The boys in the planes just didn't like them. Air crews really were not enthusiastic about the early precision guided munitions. It made them fly a very predictable flight path or bomb run. The predictability came from maintaining a straight course while the bomb was guided toward its target making the plane a sitting duck for anti-aircraft fire for enemy fighters. From World War II through Korea, guided bombs had the stigma of being oddball devices that few airmen wanted a part of.
commanders took the view, I think, that it was just a quirky experiment and they were really into massive bombing. It didn't matter how many airplanes and bombs, there were plenty of them available, so you could send what you needed to destroy a target. Then came the conflict where indiscriminate bombing was no longer politically acceptable. Vietnam. The politics reached all the way into the cockpit. Air crews flew under restrictive ROEs, or rules of engagement. A long list of targets that you couldn't bomb. Contrary to what you would read in the press, we were very careful of how we hit our targets. We took pride in the fact that we could accomplish our mission exactly as, as we were told to. And we were very careful to make sure that we hit our targets, specifically what we were supposed to hit. But politics wasn't on the minds of the men devising the next generation of smart bombs. They just wanted to make a weapon that really worked and didn't endanger the pilot. A World War II ace, Korea jet pilot, and Air Force acquisitions officer named Joe Davis spark plugged the project. Well, I was in World War II. There was a lot of bombing done. We had to bomb with many, many airplanes to destroy the target. He, in his way, was an operational visionary, not a technical visionary, but he had been there and he, he knew the problems those kids were facing in Vietnam. In 1964, an executive named Glenn Penniston from a little-known company named Texas Instruments called on Davis. He had a prototype of a sensor for a proposed radar-guided bomb. On the spot, Davis wondered if the sensor could be adapted to seek out a laser beam. He gave the company a single weekend to work up a proposal. One engineer who lost his weekend was Weldon Word. I would say that 60 or 70 percent of the things that we wrote down and conceived with the slide rule that weekend stayed forever. The idea was simple. From a pointer or designator, a laser is focused on a target. Though invisible to us, to the sensor on the nose of the bomb, it's like a flashlight in the dark. The sensor is screwed to the front fuse mount of a general purpose bomb. This used what we call a birdie head that would free float in the wind as the bomb fell to the ground. That would keep it pointed in the direction the bomb is actually flying. In the front is a quadrant detector. The quadrant detector has four laser receivers. If the laser spot that's on the ground would go to the top part of the quadrant, the bomb would then steer in that direction so that the spot would be in the middle. To further simplify the design, the winglets go only hard left or hard right. Bang-bang steering, it's called, constantly correcting the bomb's course all the way to the target. This footage from 1968 is of an advanced test. Laser-guided bombs had already been proven accurate against stationary targets. But could one hit a moving target? such as this remote-controlled tank. The unmanned tank was set loose. One jet followed it with a laser beam, while the other one released the bomb. Striking within 10 feet was considered to be a direct hit. Davis's biggest challenge, though, might have been guiding the bomb through the Air Force bureaucracy. Now I wind up arguing with the two-star general. He's telling me it won't work, it's not any good. And I'm telling them we've already hit the target. We got a CEP of 10 to 12 feet. We already hit a moving tank. And then the three-star general at the end of the table shut him up. By 1968, the $3,000 weapon was deployed in Vietnam. This time, the air crews approved. We used them primarily against pinpoint targets. Laser bombs were perfect for pinpoint targets, such as targets like gun emplacements, uh, AAA. Uh, we used them against uh, like bulldozers even, or we'd, we'd try to pick the exact point we'd want to cut a road to stop traffic from flowing. Air crews called them Zots, a name borrowed from Flash Gordon. Zot vanished, but one other nickname stuck. I heard the term smart bomb when I was in that squadron. We used to call them smart bombs, and the, the unguided bombs were called dumb bombs. 
In a single operation against a bridge in 1972, Smart won out over Dumb. This was one of the deadliest airspaces of the Vietnam War. Above the so-called Dragon's Jaw, the Tan Hoa Bridge over the Song Ma River. For five years, the steel and concrete reinforced bridge had been impervious to conventional bombs. Where they'd flown hundreds of sorties, lost dozens of airplanes and crews trying to destroy this uh, massive iron bridge. Aircraft strike after aircraft strike went into the area and dropped their dumb bombs. Unfortunately, most of these bombs drifted in the wind and missed the target. So there were craters all around the area of the bridge, but the bridge was still standing. In May 1972, eight planes were sent against the bridge. Four planes trained lasers on the target, while the other four released their bombs. Four direct hits, and the dragon's jaw had taken a knockout punch. Everything up to now had been prehistory. Other devices had been complex and technology laden, but the laser guided bomb was smart. I would say that was really the first weapon that worked, and it worked so well that. Air crews didn't mind dropping them. In fact, they were enthusiastic about dropping them. Still, they were small fry in the big picture. Politically, Vietnam was an aberration. It was a small war, and we're still in the heart of the Cold War. These things aren't going to happen on a regular basis. But the small war would become all too regular, giving rise to both a seeing eye bomb and a GPS bomb that could literally hit what it couldn't see. During the Vietnam War, the U.S. dropped more than 7 million tons of bombs, fewer than 25,000 tons of which were laser-guided. Smart Bombs will return on Modern Marvels. You are the bomb, hunting the enemy and hurtling towards him at thousands of feet per second. That's the unnerving image you get from an electro-optical bomb. Optical bombs were a 1960s update of the old TV bombs of World War II. A camera's in the nose, but the pilot doesn't need to manually steer the bomb in. He just clicks on the part of the screen he wants to hit. The bomb itself can lock on to a portion of that TV image and then steer itself to that precise point. Or as pilots call it, fire and forget. This is a 1971 version of the walleye electro-optical bomb. They cost $35,000 each, and like your camera, had a lens cap you had to remember to remove. During flight, a second protective cap is jettisoned. Now the bomb's eye is wide open. Target is locked. Walleye hits the bait. Throughout the Cold War, smart bombs were overshadowed by nuclear weapons. Then in 1990, the Soviet Union ceased to be. Gone too was the prime reason for all those thousands of nukes. Mad or mutually assured destruction. One year later, a new generation of super weapons was ready for their primetime debut. Of course, Desert Storm was a, a media event in a lot of cases. I mean, you'd get a lot of footage from uh, Vietnam and see those things, but it would be events that happened weeks ago. During Desert Storm, you're getting things that happened last night. During the 30 days of aerial bombardment, all the talk was of smart bombs. Oh, that building is gone. Gun camera footage from electro-optical weapons put TV viewers inside the bomb. Laser-guided bombs were even more accurate, striking an average of three meters away from the crosshairs. The word plink entered the vocabulary, as in tank plinking, where smart bombs destroyed enemy vehicles. 
Another euphemism, collateral damage, gained currency. The number of civilians or collateral dead and injured were fewer than the saturation bombing campaigns of previous wars. But when the 30 days were over, the numbers didn't quite stack up to the hype. The military had relied mostly on the conventional or dumb arsenal. Just 17% of bombs dropped were smart. The primary precision-guided munitions delivery platform was the F-111, and there was only one wing of those that had that capability. So you're still looking at a limited force to be able to deliver them, but they were able to destroy a disproportionate number of targets because of the precision guidance that they had. One thing the Desert Storm proved was what smart bombs couldn't do. Laser-guided bombs were only effective in almost perfect conditions. The laser-guided bombs, of course, require a laser beam to go all the way from the airplane to the target. That requires it to be line of sight. Clouds or even battlefield smoke could disrupt line of sight, disabling the lasers. Electro-optical bombs could dive beneath the clouds or smoke to reveal a target. But they were useless at night. General Merrill McPeak, for one, saw an urgent need for a new kind of smart bomb. In this handwritten note, the Air Force Chief of Staff groped for a solution. And he just wrote a note that said, I need an all-weather precision-guided munition. And there was a question on it that maybe it would be radar-guided. He didn't know what he wanted, but he knew he wanted something different from what he had. In a few short years, McPeak got what he wanted. And it wasn't radar, but GPS, Global Positioning System. The solution used the same GPS system that your rich cousin has in his Lexus and your rich uncle has in his yacht. It's a system that uses satellites to transmit your location on the face of the Earth in terms of latitude, longitude, and altitude. Four satellites are used to determine a GPS location. Each satellite precisely computes its distance from a place in terms of how long it takes for a radio signal to reach it. There's a single point in three-dimensional space where the distances will intersect. That's the GPS location. The new satellite-guided bomb was named JDAM. JDAM stands for Joint Direct Attack Munition. Joint means that it's used by more than one service. In this case, it's used by the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marine Corps. And direct attack means it's really a short-range munition. It's not a long-range powered missile. A JDAM is usually dropped within 15 miles of a target. GPS tells the bomb where it is and where it's going. How it actually gets there is the job of its guidance system, called inertial navigation, which tracks the movement of the bomb through space. This inertial navigation system can sense when it, it moves up, when it moves down, when it rotates, and every time it moves in any direction, it tells the computer what direction and how much it moved. So if it knows where it started, any time it moves, it can tell you where it is now. Inertial navigation by itself is reasonably accurate. With GPS assist, it's precise. The inertial navigation system is a precise clock. The GPS is used to calibrate the clock over and over again to keep it as precise as possible. They did grossly undershoot one target, that of cost. The original cost ceiling was set at $40,000. The actual production figure was half that. One of the main advantages of JDAM is that it's a very low cost weapon. So you don't have to worry about spending a million dollars on a silver bullet. It's $20,000 each, and the Air Force and the Navy know that they can use a lot of them if they need to. Among the disadvantages, with a GPS bomb, you can only hit stationary targets, buildings, not vehicles. But other bombs could blink tanks. With the JDAM, the Precision Dream Team was complete. Laser guidance for greatest precision. GPS assist for all weather day and night bombing. Electro optics for the flexibility of flying the bomb. Throughout the 90s, the arsenal was rolled out. So we see in 91 in the Gulf War, then in 99 in Kosovo, 2002 in Afghanistan, and then 2003 in Iraq, this ramping up of the employment of precision-guided munitions. 
66% of all bombs dropped in the Second Iraq War were precision guided. Smart bombs had clearly affected a revolution in arms. But critics were asking, what about the news accounts of weapons gone tragically off course? How can smart bombs go dumb? One smart bomb was entirely designed, built, and deployed during the 43-day duration of the Gulf War. The laser-guided GBU-28 Bunker Buster had a body improvised from surplus howitzer barrels. Smart bombs will return on Modern Marvels. Precision-guided bombs usually live up to the name. But why do a persistent few go off course, sometimes hitting precisely the wrong targets? Check out this crater. Mark Garlasco has seen both sides of the precision arsenal. He's a former intelligence officer who left the Pentagon to become a civilian watchdog. It was kind of strange for me. Uh, you know, I had been one of the folks involved in actually determining the aim points, and here I was standing in front of these buildings, uh, working on a mission for Human Rights Watch to assess the conduct of the war. Ah, uh, there's the telecommunications center. 5,000 pounder right down the belly. So I knew what the aim points were, and I was able to look at buildings and say, gosh, you know, in this case, uh, each one of these weapons struck exactly where they were supposed to. Or in some cases, you know, hey, there was one miss, or this one was off a few hundred yards. This is the Nazaria Bath Party headquarters. As you can see, the facility is completely destroyed. According to the Pentagon, smart bombs are 80% accurate. One in five is a miss. Of these, a small percentage just don't work. These are mechanical devices, and all mechanical devices have a certain error. Uh, a JDAM, for example, has about a 2% mechanical error. And just because of the nature of mechanical devices, it will fail 2% of the time. Then you also have human error. You've got to have a person inputting the coordinates for where the bomb is going to be dropped. And if they make a mistake, people will die. There are also intelligence errors, despite a rigorous system of targeting. When I was in the Pentagon, intelligence drove targeting. And we would take a look at what the objective was. And we would feed targets to the warfighter. There would be a review of those targets. Uh, lawyers would look at it for uh, compliance with international humanitarian law and uh, then the warfighter would push it back to us and say these are the ones that we still have on the target list. With potentially hundreds or thousands of targets on that list, there will be errors. Kosovo, May 1999. CIA targeteers choose a building in downtown Belgrade they believe to be a weapons depot and dispatch a B-2 bomber with five JDAM GPS guided weapons to strike it. Were they accurate? Very accurate. All five struck the building. All five struck their aim points. The problem is, the building wasn't what they thought it was. The building was the Chinese embassy. There were two dozen casualties, four killed, and the United States had a diplomatic crisis on its hands. The official explanation was that targeteers were working from an older map of the city. The Chinese embassy had moved years earlier. In Iraqi freedom, the problem wasn't that we didn't have the right address. It was that often, no one was home. One of the issues is, a lot of the buildings were empty. When the bombings took place at the beginning of the war, the Iraqis had plenty of lead time, and they knew that the war was coming. So this is one of Saddam's bunkers. You know, when I was in the Pentagon, you're doing the best job that you can with the information that you have. And you have to understand that the adversary is doing his very best to deny the information from you. And so you're trying to put together a puzzle from thousands of miles away. Or sometimes from just a hilltop away. Like Mark Garlasco, Green Beret Captain Jason Amarine has also seen both sides of smart bombs saved by laser bombs one day, struck by a 2,000-pound JDAM the next. 
in what's been called the worst friendly fire incident of the Afghanistan war. In 2001, after the World Trade Center bombing, my detachment was alerted to deploy to Afghanistan to conduct unconventional warfare operations. By November 2001, Captain Amarin and his Green Berets were fighting alongside Northern Alliance leader Hamid Karzai. They relied on precision airstrikes to hold their own against overwhelming Taliban forces. And when we described our location to the aircraft overhead, the response was, uh, that's all you've got. And the pilots, to their credit, knew exactly how dire the situation was. And before long, the sky was just loaded with F-18s and F-14s were coming to our aid. And they bombed the hell out of that Taliban convoy all morning as we directed the airstrikes. On December 5th, the little guerrilla unit had advanced closer to Kandahar. Karzai had just been named interim president of Afghanistan. He was expecting to receive surrender terms from Kandahar at any moment. A separate army command unit was directing airstrikes against some Taliban diehards. From 39,000 feet, a B-52 bomber released a JDAM bomb that was a direct hit on Captain Amarine's position. When the bomb hit, it hit just out of the blue. There's no whistle, there's no telltale sign that a bomb's about to strike. All I knew is there was a massive explosion and I flew through the air. That morning, I lost 22 of my Afghani soldiers, 22 of my best Afghani soldiers. I also lost my team sergeant, Jefferson Davis, my senior communication sergeant, Daniel Petitori. A friend of mine that was with the headquarters named Cody Prosser was also killed. Amorine himself had both eardrums blown out and shrapnel in his leg. Hamid Karzai was wounded in the face. The preliminary report on the incident called a fatality bulletin, blamed an overconfident operator who, quote, failed to have his assistant double check and confirm his target calculations. And so you have three Americans died in the strike, and Hamid Karzai almost died. Now, had, the, uh, had he been killed, where would Afghanistan be today? Having experienced the alpha and omega of smart bombs, what does Captain Amarine think? One thing I can't stress enough is things are going to go wrong. It's never going to be sterile. You're always going to be hurting people that you intend to hurt and also people you don't intend to hurt. It's just you do your best to, to make sure that the bombs are dropping on the right target. Warheads on foreheads, as a friend of mine would say. The 80% of direct hits means the technology works. The occasional accidents remind us that war will never really be surgical. The danger in thinking that smart bombs are somehow safe is that we may be quicker on the trigger. The threshold for going to war is lowering. The more you use these weapons, the more we see in these weapons a license uh, to resort to war more frequently, uh, the more we will see that civilian casualties are not a thing of the past. But it's the military's job to be ready for any eventuality. Future wars may be fought with smart weapons like these, robot paratroopers and pinwheeling killing machines. The average time for choosing and approving smart bomb targets in Desert Storm was 72 hours. By Operation Iraqi Freedom, the average was only a fraction of that and could be done in as little as 12 minutes. Smart bombs will return on Modern Marvels. On March 11, 2003, at Eglin Air Force Base, a giant weapon with the gaudy nickname Mother of All Bombs was tested. It is a smart bomb. It has an INS GPS kit on it. It can be launched from very high altitudes and therefore can attack targets very precisely. MOAB, or Massive Ordnance Airburst Bomb, about $170,000 a piece, packed with 21,000 pounds of explosives, designed in part to clear out large areas of vegetation. This'll buzz cut your back 40. 
but it's not the future of smart bombs. Except for its precision guidance, Moab is an old-fashioned weapon known as a daisy cutter. But the trend in smart bombs is away from heavyweights like Moab to smaller and lighter ordnance. The more accurate the bomb, the less boom you need. This is a test of the SDB, or small diameter bomb. The $100,000 plus bomb is actually a mini bunker buster. Like its big brothers, it's guided by GPS and can penetrate more than six feet of reinforced concrete. But the SDB's warhead weighs a mere 50 pounds. Even non-explosive dummy bombs, once only used for practice, have been dropped on the enemy. Instead of high explosives inside the bombs, they used concrete to give it the same weight, and they allowed the accuracy of the paveway, the laser guidance, to actually take out the specific target without the explosion and without destroying anything surrounding the target. The other trend in precision bombing is known as joint standoff, giving weapons great range, allowing pilots to stand off miles from harm's way. The Joint Air-to-Surface Standoff Missile, or JASM, is just now finalizing its operational test. So this has not been used in operational use yet, has not seen war. However, it's been very successful in its testing, and this is essentially the future of our weaponry. Costing between four and $600,000, JASM can fly to a war zone up to 70 miles away. Arriving above an enemy position, it begins circling, trolling for targets while feeding TV images back to command stations. That allows the weapon to be loitering in the area of the target, waiting for something to occur, and in fact could receive commands against different targets after it's left the airplane. The ultimate smart bomb is one that chooses targets as well as attacks them. What's known as an autonomous weapon. Possibly, they're the battlefield robots of the future. One autonomous system is a so-called sensor-fused weapon. Sensor-fused means it's packing different weapons, choosing them on the basis of what it sees. Parachuting from the bomb are many can-shaped objects. Miniature rotors help each one patrol a battlefield while sensors scan the area. It would look for a heat signature. Uh, it might look for a shape. Uh, it might look for a sound. The particular heat signature of a tank would signal the weapon to release an armor-piercing round. This is a live fire test against tanks of the $300,000 plus weapon. For human targets, it would choose to spray a lethal hail of bomblets. Autonomous and standoff weapons may finally fulfill the 85-year-old goal of precision weaponry to remove the pilot from the bombing equation. With pilotless drones and autonomous weapons, the dogfight may one day go the way of the medieval joust. Pilots of my generation feel like that potentially we're the last generation that's going to be able to serve out a full career in frontline combat aircraft that are manned. the aerial torpedo to the laser-guided bomb to joint standoff weapons. Safeguarding pilots has always been the goal. Protecting non-combatants, the humanitarian bonus. You know, in the Second World War, you had things such as Dresden, where entire cities were bombed. Or you had Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where just huge, massive amounts of civilian casualties were sustained. That's something that no one ever wants to happen again. With precision weapons, there may never be another Dresden. But there may be many more Baghdads. Bombs may be smart, but history will judge how intelligently they're used.